Okay, so new topic, centripetal force and acceleration. For motion in a circle, does the object have any sort of force acting on it? And as a result, will the object be accelerating in any direction? That's what we are going to be figuring out in the following steps. So the first thing, the first few things that we know right now is velocity is a vector, right? And why is it that velocity is a vector? Because velocity is a, is a comprised component of both a magnitude and the direction. Now, we know in circular motion, if an object, let's say this, is the trajectory, this is the center, and of radius r and the angular displacement is theta and there are two points that I want to mark one is over here let's say this is the tangential velocity for point a let's name it v a or velocity a and another one would be let's say at point B. So let's call it velocity B. And it's the tangential velocity at B. Fair enough. So we know that in circular motion, the direction is constantly changing. Even though the magnitude is the exact same. Because you're pulling or uh, rotating the object with the same force or the same pull on the string. So, assuming you are applying the same force or you are uh, rotating it with the same motion, the speed is same throughout. So, if the speed is same and the velocity is changing, I mean the direction is changing, is the velocity changing? Yes, it is. Because even if the magnitude is the same. Velocity comprises of both magnitude and direction. So even if one component, which is the direction, changes, you have to consider it a change in velocity. So now we're clear about another thing, which is the velocity keeps changing. So if the velocity is changing constantly, there must be a sort of acceleration. Because we know the formula of acceleration, we know the formula of acceleration to be change in velocity by change in time. So if there is a change in velocity with respect to time, there is some sort of acceleration. Okay. So we know since there is a change in velocity with time, there is acceleration. Now, how can we deduce that mathematically? And how can we assume or find out the direction of the acceleration? In which direction is the object accelerating? Because for one thing, we know that the velocities are not changing and they're moving in a constantly changing trajectory, in a circular motion. So which direction is the accelerate, acceleration acting? So first of all, let's write now. So Vf is the final velocity, and let's take it as velocity at V. And Vi is velocity initial, let's take it as Va. If we do that, let's substitute Vn and Vv. This is what we get. Now remember, over here, we need to consider the vector, meaning we need to consider the direction. Because 
we know the magnitude is not the factor, the main thing over here. The main objective is the direction, the change in direction. So we need to consider the change in direction. Okay. So both of these, velocity b and c are vectors. Okay. Now, since we're doing all of this to find out the direction of uh, acceleration, the best way to do that is drawing a vector diagram. We know the tangential velocity and the direction of those velocities, these two arrows. So, if you want to figure out the change in the, the direction of change in velocity, you have to uh, draw the vector diagram to see in which direction the change in velocity is. So let's do that. Okay, so I've only drawn the two arrow heads. Now the question is, why did I draw VA in the opposite direction? This is pointing upwards and this is pointing downwards. Now why did I do that? Look over here. Um, VB minus VA gives you the change in velocity, right? So we want to figure out the change in velocity, right? And in order to do that, in order to do that, we have put a negative sign in front of VA, denoting the, uh, the direction of VA or velocity A is in the opposite direction when we are drawing the vector diagram. Since this vector has a sign negative in front of it, we are dra uh, drawing VA in the exact opposite direction, right? So the yellow arrow is actually giving you the direction of change in velocity vector due to VB and VA. This is, this is direction of change in velocity. VB is in this direction, in this direction, and VA, VA is in this direction, not upwards, since there is a, a negative sign in front of VA. So we have reversed the direction and put it downwards. And what is the resultant of these two vectors? What will be the resultant of these two vectors? It's going to bisect these two vectors in this direction. And this gives you the change in velocity, the change in velocity which is also going to give you the value or the direction for acceleration. Why is that? Because acceleration, acceleration is change in velocity by change in time. So if the direction of change in velocity is towards the center, is towards the center, in that case, the rate of change of velocity is towards the center as well. So if the rate of change of velocity is towards the center, we know the acceleration is acting towards the center. No matter where you pick the points, where you pick the points on this diagram, you're going to get that the, uh, the change of velocity, the rate of change of velocity is acting towards the center. You can draw the vector diagram for any point on the circle and get the direction for change of velocity to be towards the center. Okay, so there is another way to find the change in velocity or di the direction of change in velocity without reversing the direction of VA using the vector diagram. So let's say, let's say we keep the direction of VB in this direction exactly like over here. And let's say that we keep the direction of VA like in the diagram and draw it upwards. VA and this is VB. Now, what do you get if you draw tail to head arrow? What do you get over here? This is not the change in velocity. This is the change or the direction for resultant velocity. This is resultant velocity. Resultant. 
But this is not what you're trying to figure out. What you're trying to figure out is the change in velocity, the direction for change in velocity. So what you can do for that is rearrange the arrowheads and let's say we bring it over here and draw the new arrowhead from wait from head to head. And what do you have over here? You have the direction for change in velocity. Change in velocity. And this matches with this. This is pointing at the center as well. You're taking, you're taking the value of VA and you're taking the value of VB and finding out the change in velocity. You can use whichever makes more sense to you. Um, you can use this as well to find out the change in velocity, which is VB minus the vector VA uh, and find out the resultant over here, which is going to give you the change in velocity, the change in velocity. Okay, so by this you can deduce that the direction for acceleration or rate of change of velocity is towards the center. Fair enough. So next up, we have a few examples of circular motion. And since we have already figured out that for a moving object in a circular trajectory, the direction of force or the direction of acceleration is towards the middle. We have still not talked about the force, so we'll uh, figure it out after we talk about these four examples. So one thing we know is the object is accelerating towards the center. And let's say for the bucket, the tangential velocity is in that direction. But since it is accelerating towards the middle, there must be a force acting on the bucket which is causing the bucket to accelerate towards the center. Now we know force is equals to m a. Therefore, for there to be an acceleration, for there to be an acceleration, you need a resultant force. So for these examples, we need to figure out what is giving that uh, resultant force. What is giving rise to that acceleration. So let's say for the bucket it's being pulled on by the stream and this is going in circles, right? Now since this is moving in a circular path and the acceleration is towards the center, there must be must be a force acting in this direction and that is due to the stream being pulled. And what do we call the force where you're pulling an object? We call it tension. We call it tension. So this is tension. So what is giving rise to the resultant force? It is tension. Now there are other forces acting on uh, the bucket. For example, um, the weight of the bucket um, if the bucket has, yeah, it has water. So there is weight of the water as well. There is reaction force. So later on, when we're talking about circular motion in vertical plane, we will be deducing or deriving all the components and figuring out how, how the resultant is in this direction, even though there are other forces acting on it. But for now, you need to know that there is a force towards the center. And that resultant force is due to mainly tension. And there are other forces, and we will calculate for those later on as well. So let's look in this. Uh, look at this example. You have a car moving in a circular path. Great. So for this example, um, what would you assume is giving the force towards the center or the centripetal force. Centripetal force is basically the force acting towards 
the center, right? So, what could give rise to a resultant force towards the center? So, the main force acting and giving rise to this circular trajectory is friction. Now, let's say, let's say the tires are initially in this direction. Wait. Let's say the tires are moving in this direction. Okay, this is a very bad tire. So let's say the tire is moving in this direction. Now, to turn rightwards, you need to move the tire, right? You need to move the tire rightwards, and the new position for the tire is going to be in this direction. This changed, the tire changed its angle and moved from position A to position B. It rotated the tires in this direction. Now, as it does that, as it does that, the tires, let's say this is the tire, is going to exert, is going to exert a force, force by tire on road. So the tire is exerting a force on the road as it as it uh, changes the direction and continues to rotate. As it changes the direction and continues to rotate, it's the tires are exerting a force on the road. Now the road is not going to sit down and do nothing about that. Now we know from Newton's third law, every action will have a repulsion force. So, the road will exert a force on the tire as well. The force, sorry, the uh, road will exert a force on the tire as well and in the opposite direction. So, if uh, the tires are exerting a force in this direction, in this direction, which is, which is, let's say, if the tires are in this direction, and it rotates like this, it will exert a force in this direction. The tires will exert a force on the road in this direction. So what will the friction do? The friction will exert a force in this direction opposite to the direction of rotation of the tire. So if the tire has moved from this, from this direction to this direction and is rotating in this direction, it moves from this direction, the tire moves from this direction to this direction and is rotating in this direction. In that case, uh, the motion of rotation for the tire is outwards, outwards and the friction will be exerted on the tires inwards. So, if the tire is moving in this direction, friction will be in this direction, acting on the tires opposite to the motion. So, in this case, the force giving the resultant uh, centripetal force is actually due to friction. Friction is providing you the resultant force, due to which you can have this circular motion. Okay, next example, we have a satellite rotating around, let's say, a planet, it's orbiting a planet. So, what is the force acting on the satellite inwards that results in this orbit? It's pretty simple. It's obviously um, gravitational force, Fg, due to which the satellite is attracted and there is acceleration towards the center due to gravitational force. Okay, so next example, we have a roller coaster. So, let's say this roller coaster will have a weight mg. It will have a weight mg towards the center. 
from this you can guess already that the centripetal acceleration is caused by the weight. But there is there are also other components or other forces acting, with one of which could be normal force. Now you could guess and assume that the normal force is supposed to be supposed to be equal to mg. But that is not necessarily always true. Because if let's say let's say the weight was five newtons and normal reaction force is also let's say five newtons due to the weight in that case both the forces would cancel out and there would be no centripetal acceleration. There would be no centripetal acceleration and the object would stop rotating in this direction. So let's say in a formula it would look something like this. We're trying to find out the resultant force. So let's denote it as Fc, centripetal force. And you'll get the centripetal force from the difference between the inwards force, which is mg. Let's write it as mg. And a normal reaction force, n. So, in this case, when the centripetal force is zero, the object would stop moving in this circular path. So, uh, we know that if the normal reaction force equals to the weight of the object, you will have no more any sort of centripetal force. What if um, the centripetal force is actually 5 newtons? Meaning, if Fc is 5, it means mg minus 0 minus zero because we know the weight is five newtons and you're telling me that fc is five so in that case in that case five is equals to you will have n is equals to zero so the normal reaction force if the centripetal force is indeed five newtons would be zero what would that mean? That would mean that the roller coaster would no longer remain on the rails and it would fly off because normal reaction force denotes contact force. If there is zero contact force, it means the roller coaster is no longer in contact with the rails. So it would fly off. Um, these are the two extreme scenarios where either um, normal reaction force is mg or normal reaction forces zero. We'll be doing a question similar to this problem later on at the end, but these examples are basically to clear out the conception of how the force acts, in which direction the force acts, and what causes that centripetal force. Later on, we'll be talking about the derivation of formulas for acceleration and the forces. Okay, so let's talk about a few uh, formulas for centripetal force and acceleration. Now, for centripetal acceleration, centripetal acceleration that's denoted as AC. AC is, is going to be, acceleration is going to be V squared by R, where R is radius and V is Tangential velocity. Tangential velocity. Now, there is another uh, formula for acceleration. If you substitute the value of, substitute the value of V is equals to R omega. If you do that, you're going to get R omega squared by R. So S E is going to be R omega square. These are the two formulas for centripetal acceleration. Okay, so now for 
we did acceleration. So centripetal force for centripetal force. The formulas are F is equals to MA, which is the formula we are all known to. Now, if we substitute the formula for acceleration, which is, let's say, V square by R, V square by R, F is equals to MV square by R. This is one formula for the force if you substitute acceleration. Now you can also substitute the tangential velocity, which is V is equal to R omega, V is R omega, and you, you will get M times R omega whole square by R, F is equals to M, M R omega square. You might have to use this a lot in further questions from question papers and if you're solving the book for questions. So these are the few ex uh, expressions for centripetal acceleration and centripetal force. You can derive one from the other once you know the basic uh, equations. If you know this, you can derive everything in one words because you already know if is equal to ma. So yeah, these are the main few formulas. All right. Um, now, you might be wondering, how did we derive the equation for centripetal acceleration? Because as I said, this is the main formula. What I mean by main formula is, if you have this, if you have the formula for a centripetal acceleration, you can derive all of these. You can derive all of these. Okay, so now we want to figure out how we have derived the equation for centripetal acceleration. All right, so derising <clears throat> AC, let's draw a circle. <clears throat> Center C with radius R. And let's see two points V A and V B. Mm -hmm. What are the tangential velocities? It's going to be in this direction for V B. It's going to be in this direction for V A. The magnitudes are same. So And the angle between the two radius is going to be theta. Right? Okay. So we want to express the velocities in a vector diagram similar to before over here to derive the uh, formula for acceleration. So let's draw V and VB vectors. VB is going to be in this direction. VB is going to be In this direction. So between both both of these vectors, we have the difference, difference, del V. Del V. So similar to before, from the direction for del V, you already know the direction for centripetal acceleration. But that's not what we're looking for. We want to figure out the formula for centripetal acceleration. So if V A is in the in this direction and V B is in this direction, the change V uh, del V is in this direction and the magnitude is. So over here, the theta is the angle between the two radius. Over here, theta is the angle between the two vectors as well. Reason is reason is, let's say another circle, for another circle, if the center was over here, and 
these are the two radius and the vectors are this and this if you take these both arrowheads and try to find out the angle between in between you will find out that the angle is actually theta or this angle sorry yeah so if you try to find out the angle between these two arrowheads it's going to be theta the same angle which is why we can say the angle between vector v a and v b is always going to be theta if that's the case if that's the case um we can draw another vector or another diagram which is similar to this and that will be in terms of distance meaning radius so let's draw it let's say both the radius r r and r and the distance between these two distance between these two we can denote it as v times del d why do we do that why is it that the distance between these two points is v times del t you know this arc length you can find out the value of arc length by multiplying the tangential velocity which is va or vb because now you need the magnitude the speed which is the exact same for va or vb because the magnitude of speed is not changing only the direction is changing so if you multiply the tangential velocity v times the change in time which is let's say del t you will get the arc length you will get the arc length so v times del t is actually the arc length now you may ask why are we taking why are we taking the arc length because arc length is not the linear displacement between these two points the arc length is supposed to be greater than the linear displacement between va and vb however even the the diagrams in the diagrams the theta is really large we are trying to find out the instantaneous acceleration so in that case the theta is really small it's really really small and for small angles i've already mentioned this before for really small angles the arc length arc length equals to the linear displacement linear displacement so if the arc length is equal to the linear displacement we can say that that the displacement between these two points is v times del t which is the arc length but it's approximately the same as the uh, the linear displacement now why are we assuming the theta to be really small or almost negligible um the reason we do that is let's say you're calculating the gradient for a slope in physics what did you used to do you would take a point and draw a small line sorry draw a small line and find out the change in this uh, velocity or displacement let's say this is velocity and time you take the change in velocity take the change in velocity and divide by change in time to get the instantaneous acceleration similarly for instantaneous acceleration over here you're taking a very small change in theta a very small change in theta to get the instantaneous acceleration it's in a way uh similar to what you do in differentiation you're taking a small change in value and dividing it by a small uh by the other small unit to get the 
rate, instantaneous rate. All right, so now we know that the theta, the theta between both these, both these sides are equal in both of these places. So we can assume that both of these triangles are equal. Both of these are isosceles triangles. Since VA equals to VB and radius equals to radius and the theta is the same. Therefore, this and this is equal as well. So we can use ratios to find out the acceleration. So let's say del V, del V divided by any side VA or VB because the magnitude does not change. So let's say it's V denoting VA is equals to VB is equals to V. Let's say V is equals to VA or VB. So I'm writing as del V by V. And from this side, we are taking V times del T, change in time, divided by any one side, which is the radius, divided by R. If you take del V by del T on one side, del T, you will get V squared by R. This is how you get um, the equation for centripetal acceleration, V squared by R. So this is the derivation for centripetal acceleration.